Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Okay, culture as we know it today has its origins primarily in the pastoral civilization, but significantly in the agrarian civilizations. The agrarian civilizations grew very strong and widespread and very deep in their cultural implications through time. The earliest that we remember in this subcontinent is of course, the civilizations of Mohenjo-Daro and Harappa, which were all agrarian and which throve in the basin of the river Sindh. More generally, almost all agrarian civilizations were located close to water. which is why all major rivers and river and delta regions became big centers of agrarian cultures and civilizations. Point is very simple, if you had water, you could irrigate more land. If you had more irrigated land, you could grow more crops, as simple as that. So, the economics of agriculture dictated the way the civilizations of agrarian civilizations grew. It is the first clear illustration of the close relationship between economic forces and cultural forces. Great cultural centers in the delta of Tanjore in the delta of Kaveri in Tanjore, in the delta of Mahanadi, in the delta of Godavari and the whole Gangetic plain. These great civilizations came about for the simple reason that there was plenty of water to irrigate the land, which means a lot of crops could be grown and people could live. So, that the tie up between economics and culture was very close through human history. In some respects, it is even possible to argue, the earliest culture was actually agriculture, because it was the earliest system of organized knowledge, which people developed, how to tame nature how to manage nature, all about the seasons, all about water, all about soils, land, mountains, the wind, the rains. So, it is quite possible to argue that the earliest culture was actually agriculture. Around agriculture was woven the civilization of agrarian plains, plains where agricultural land was tamed and cultivated and yielded food. Invariably, agriculture in European conditions took on different forms than it took on in the Asian conditions. In Asia and in Africa, in the valley of Nile in Africa, in the valleys of the rivers Tigris and Euphrates, which came to be known as the great Mesopotamian civilization, in the valley of the Sindh, in the valley of the Ganges, in the valley of the Kaveri, Brahmaputra, Godavari, Narmada in the valley of the river Airavadi, in all the great Chinese rivers, 
the river Mekong in Indo, in Indo, Indo China, all of these became great civilizations, because all of them were places with plenty of water. So, there is a parallel civilization which grew on the fringes of agrarian civilizations, which did not have the benefit of water. These were pastoral communities, which were mainly based on their nomadic herds on the fringes of the green lush food tracts. These were dry lands where there was not much water, where there was not much irrigation, but there was enough for the grazing herds to eat. So, these pastoral people lived on the fringes of great agrarian civilizations and you can see immediately the potential of conflict. One had all the water, another did not have water one had all the benefits of a steady stable life based on availability of water, another had only the benefit of an insecure wandering life running after your herds of animals. One had very little uncertainty, the other's life was full of uncertainty. So, the pastoral civilizations gradually developed a hostile relationships with the agrarian civilizations. So, you had two different cultures developing in many parts of Asia. You had, a, you had the culture of wetlands, which means culture of lands which were well irrigated, which had rivers and other places giving them water. So, you had a culture of the wetland area. Then you had the culture of all those places which did not have this water. So, you had the culture of the dry lands. So, from around the 3rd or 4th century AD in South India for instance, you had a distinct growth of two different types of civilizations in South Indian linguistic areas. They would speak Tamil, they would speak Telugu, they would speak all that, but they would be very different in their organization. You had dry land culture, you had the wetland culture. <coughs> the wetland cultures were much less insecure, much better organized to cope with uncertainty and the dry land cultures were a lot more insecure. I had very little organizational ability to cope with insecurity and uncertainty. So, this is a growing pattern and as more and more and more forests are destroyed and agrarian settlements are created more and more of the dry land cultures are becoming wetland cultures. Some of the great empires grew out of this incorporation of the dry land people into wetland cultures. Have you heard of a great king in the Tamil country? It is a, it's a sad thing of course, that most of Indian history is considered North Indian history. We do not study much South Indian history in Indian school history textbooks, but those of you who are aware of South Indian history would have heard of a very great king called Raja Raja the first, considered probably the greatest among South Indian monarchs, probably considered the greatest among Indian monarchs, because he was the first one who colonized, who colonized large parts of Indonesia, the present day Singapore and occupied those territories and created Tamil like civilizations in those places. There was a debate about 20 years ago among historians, where did Rajaraja get his army from? Did he have a whole group of mercenary soldiers who fought for wages and who whom he employed like a modern army? If that was the case, he needed enormous amount of funds, vast access to stores of food with which he could feed these soldiers 
and enormous ability to sustain uncertainties of looking after such a large body of people. There was no king in the history of India till the Muslims came to rule India who had this ability including the Vijayanagar kings, including Shivaji, including Raja Raja. So, where did they get the strength from? Where did they get the manpower, fighting manpower from? We know in the case of Raja Raja, there is evidence, epigraphic evidence which tells you that he incorporated, he incorporated a lot of dry land people, inducted them into his army with the promise of wetlands after they fought the war, with the promise of lands capable of agriculture, irrigation and so forth and a social status among the wetland people. So, a number of tribal groups which were on the fringes of Raja Raja's empire got drawn in by this attraction of more secure life. So, they became fighting forces of Raja Raja. They went with him to wars. Not only did they share the booty from the war wars, when they came back they were granted land. They were told here this is your village, this is where you have your agriculture, I protect you. So, they became agrarian people, they became new castes. So, the society became more complex. So, the development of agriculture involves the development of more and more and more complexity socially and politically in the society. Right. In all this, the old question still remains uncertainty. Uncertainty still face the people. Uncertainty did uncertainty did not come in the form of just foot and mouth diseases, which still existed, which still consumed the cattle, but there were other uncertainties. You could have a pest which wipes out an entire crop. You could have a drought which could destroy hundreds of villages in an area, depopulate the area. Right? You could have what is called an andhi in the north, vast quantities of dust swirling in a huge wind and when the wind passes the dust settles and a lot of crops which are standing crops ready to be harvested can be wiped out by a single andhi. This was a terror in Tamil Nadu agriculture. This was a terror for all the people in the delta of Kaveri. They used to call it Manmari, the rain of dust. When a rain of dust came, hundreds of villages were wiped out for quite a few years because it is not just that the crops are destroyed, the lands which had been prepared with so much care and diligence became unfit for agriculture. So, uncertainty persisted, uncertainty still persisted in different forms and the need to organize yourself coping with this uncertainty persisted too. What is the best way of coping with uncertainty? You have uncertainties, all of us have uncertainties in life. What is the best way of coping with uncertainties? We have different options. Lovely. Standard insurance agent's argument, but perfect. So, what are, what are the options you can think of for instance? I mean if you are growing paddy in an area, growing rice in an area because there is lot of water and everything is suitable there for rice and what uncertainty would you expect? You would expect some, some pests to come and destroy the crops or failure of rains and things like that. So, what options can you have against those? occupation. Which is true, which is true there was a bit of handicrafts, this bit of dairying going on, but everything depends on water. If there is a drought that uncertainty is destructive. No? 
you can have smaller uncertainties like a particular year the the water from the river didn't flow properly and then you probably could irrigate some other land and cultivate or you could get some cattle and depend on that cattle whatever but when there is a when there is a drought you don't do anything you just perish no so what do you do when you are faced with this not that droughts coming every year is a question but the fear what will I do if there is a drought? What will I do? Because you might have had a drought some 30 years ago or 40 years ago in your great grandfather's time, but it goes as a running legend in the family saying, on the year of drought this happened, on the year of drought, is not it? In fact, droughts are huge landmarks in the history of rural people, not just droughts, anything to do with nature. I remember in 1976, I was doing field work in two villages near Chengalpat. So, I was tabulating the you know family data in the village. So, some of the people who are 80 years old, 90 years old in the village, when I asked them there, when they were born, they would invariably say, the year when there was a big rain and storm, Kathumare. Then I had to look around the approximately which year was it. So, it spot 2, 3 years when there were big thunderstorm and rain cyclone in the bay, then I would approximately you know date this person or maybe not this cyclone, maybe that cyclone, eventually I would end up fair approximation of the person's age. But look at that, the cyclone is a landmark in their lives, so too is a drought. A drought is a terrible landmark in the lives of rural people. So, it is not just it is not just that people cope with drought when it happens, but it is a running terror, it is a running source of fear. If the rains fail, if the rains fail, if the rains fail, drought is a big thing, huge uncertainty. So, what happens to you, what happens to your mind when you are faced with this? In an agrarian community, they might have started saving uh, extra produce from the year. And Very nice. That is always what, peop what people did. People put away grains and uh, some major institutions and rural people in Tamil Nadu go back to that, that kind of a fear. You know this month Adi in Tamil is a, is a bad month, it is a dry month. There are no rains, there are it is in between harvests and this month is bad. And what would rural people do in this month? The landless people would have no food, no work, nothing at this time. It is invariably the practice of the well to do people in the village in the month of Adi to make gruels, cool, hmm? gruel porridge every day and makes it make it available to all the people in the village. Whoever wants to have this porridge can come and drink it, Anadan. So, the habit of boiling the gruel in Adi and people create innumerable religious days in Adi on which the mother goddess is worshipped and gruel is made in her temple and distributed to people. Do you realize what has happened here? It is a mechanism coping with uncertainty, but it is religious, it is religious no. This is mechanism, you say this mother goddess Angalaman or Adi Parashakti or any number of such names in which the deity might exist, you have a celebration in her temple. and. All the people come who can afford it, come and boil the, make the gruel in her, at her temple, offer it to her and then everybody is fed. So, here is a religious institution which is like an insurance, is not it? This was the most fundamental purpose of religion in all societies, it is an insurance it is an insurance against uncertainties. The question of 
whether religion served any other more distinct purposes, the religions had a purpose and meaning of their own as we all believe is not what we are taking up now. What we are looking at is what functionally religions did in society. Functionally religions helped cope, people cope with uncertainty, they acted as institutions of insurance, collective insurance. There are three ways in which this belief, this insurance worked. One is the belief that every happening in human existence was, was attributable to a single cause which stood above the human beings. Some omniscient, some omnipresent force which stood above the human beings and their existence, which determined in its benevolence, in its grace, all things that happened in human existence. In other words, uncertainty is attributed to a transhuman force, to a transcendental force which is said to be the cause of everything that happens in human life. This is the root of religion. This is the social root or sociological root of religion. You have this Devi, this Mata, who is attributed the power of supreme control over all human existence. She has a thousand names, she has a thousand forms. If it rains, it is her grace. If it does not rain, she is angry with you. If there is an epidemic, she is wild with you, you got to appease her. right? And if your life is comfortable, you offer your gratefulness to her, you thank her. In other words, she is everything. So, all of human existence become attributed to a single cause, the divine. It might be a female goddess, it might be a male god, it might be anything. But it is around this divine, it is around this central belief in the omniscient, omnipresent existence of such a being it is around this that all of life centers. In other words, people's life centers in agrarian civilizations centers around the powerful presence, the irrevocable presence of a divine force. This is the root of all religions, which is also the reason why most religions have prospered in agrarian civilizations. To repeat, I am not saying at all that religions come into existence as a product of uncertainty. I do not know about religions. I do not know where religions come from. Certainly, it is not up to me to talk about it in an economics class. But this much I can say that in a social sense, they served the center of all beliefs in the village, in the settlement. They constituted the very center of the whole scheme of organizing yourself against uncertainty. So, when uncertainty strikes you negatively, then you explain it to yourself saying, I did something wrong which displeased the mother goddess. I will please her, and next time it will not happen. So, there is hope. Or if something very beautiful happened, if there is a good rain, we have had a fabulous harvest. So, we have a tremendous celebration at her temple, lots of goats and chicken and so forth are sacrificed to her, 
lots and lots of pongal rice is cooked for her, everybody is happy, the whole village is drunk in a literal sense. So, you celebrate her grace. So, you celebrate her grace, you fear that you have angered her and you rectify for your mistakes. In short, everything centers around that faith in the divine force and the divine force becomes the other name for uncertainty. You do not any longer look at it as uncertainty, it is perfectly certain either she is angry with you or she is happy with you, that is all and you can handle the whole issue by dealing with her, by praying to her, by offering things to her, by being grateful to her and so on and so forth. So, what happens? Religion creates a huge mindset, a huge thought process according to which all human activities are predicated on divine will. Right? So, the creation of human settlements, there are epigraphic illustrations which say how the creation of human settlements across the Tamil country have come about after prayers to one particular deity. She came in your way. There is a lovely copper inscription in Kanchipuram found in the 18th century, uh, which of course is available in a print form now. The king of the Cholas feels that he has got a curse from the divine mother. Why? Because he has had a manmari which is a rain of dust in his kingdom. Crops have failed, people have died. So, he is looking to see alternatives. So, the divine mother appears before him and says, well, go to this place near forests near Kanchipuram, clear the forests and create settlements for people to live in. And across Tamil country, you go creating forests and creating human settlements. That will be the atonement for you and once again rains will come. Here is a conception of ecology which is very pragmatic. You create forests, rain will come, but which is articulated in religious terms. So, she tells him this. So, she he gathers the other kings of the Tamils, the, the Pandya and the Chera and they all arrive at Kanchipuram to look at the forests around Kanchipuram. And as they sleep there for the night, a most terrible, awesome, frightening form of a female deity appears in front of them and she says, you fellows, I am going to eat you up now. You are just, you are just interfering with my rule of this forest, this area which is entirely mine. You are trying to cut this down. I am going to destroy you, consume you, eat you up. So, they fall at her feet and say, oh mother, this is what happened. The mother of our place came and told us this and we are here. So, she said, okay. in this place each year, once in a year you should celebrate that I am the queen really of your place by having a huge feast in which you will offer sacrificial goat, sacrificial pig, sacrificial chicken and so forth. And in some places she asks for human sacrifice too. You make these sacrifices and offer me this feast, I will protect you and your people from all suffering. So, they name that place after her and a new village starts. In this way, all through Tamil country, a lot of places around Coimbatore, they have names which are mentioned in this inscription saying, this is how those places got started. Now, what I am trying to tell you here is, how central the faith in the divine force is into the agrarian people. How central it is for them to even start their civilization, run their civilization and continue to live and reproduce. So, religion becomes a very central running force and the society creates religion. It also creates ways of sustaining the belief. So, the moral universe of the society is the religious universe of the society. The whole set of do's and don'ts in human circumstances are all based on divine sanction. So, the whole moral and ethical universe of, universe of the society grows around the religious beliefs. In all civilizations of the world, religions have been at the root of moral values. 
religions have been at the root of the moral universe and our civilization is no exception. I do not know how central these moral values go now in rural areas, but I remember when I was a small boy, uh, four or five years old, I was being taught the alphabets in Tamil. And each alphabet was termed after one moral virtue. So, you had a little song which all of us were taught in which the first word would be one virtue which would start in the name with one particular alphabet. So, we were taught like this, we were taught these songs, we each was about a particular moral virtue. So, we learnt our alphabets through learning the prevalent morality of society. Not that it was a great morality or not a great morality, that is not the issue, but this is the power of the moral universe, the normative world around. So, this is what agrarian civilizations produced and the normative or moral world dictated everything, how a king should rule, how the king should function, how the people should function, what should constitute charity, how agriculture should be conducted, when to sow the crops, when to harvest the crops, how to handle pests. Everything was regulated by a huge powerful moral universe centered on the religious system. So, in large parts of the world, when westerners went and studied agricultural economies, they called them moral economies, because everything was not dictated by the marketplace, but by the moral order that prevailed there. It is a very great book which was written by a great American anthropologist called James Scott. It must be in your library, just look at it. It is called The Moral Economy of the Peasants. He studied peasants in Southeast Asia, went and lived among them. He went to study agriculture in Southeast Asia, became convinced that all of agriculture in those parts of the world were run by moral rules and not by economic rules of the market. So, he wrote a book. There is a big problem with this religion dominated moral economy. It is not a problem in the sense that it makes us suffer, but it is a problem in the sense that it creates obstacles within the agricultural world. If I am, if there is a good rain, then if I am a person in the village who is deeply religious, somebody asks me, how did it rain? I will say, oh, this Maka in our temple, she has graced us this year and there is plenty of rains, finished. But if somebody tells me, but no, you know, rains come from clouds and clouds constitute nearly liquefied vapor which has evaporated from the seas and oceans. There is a process in which these clouds are carried across land, the winds carry it and the winds happen because of thermal differences between one place and another. There is a place which is hot, there is a place which is cool, the air in the hot place rises, the air in the cool place moves in there, the clouds come in with that. In other words, there is a whole thing called hydrology involved in this. And the crucial forces on the hydrological front are the fact that the earth is spinning and that there are hot and cold places, thermal differences. The moment I finish the story, this man will say, I am going to sleep. You are wasting my time. Why are you telling me all these things? In other words, formation of knowledge 
in the society, the construction of knowledge in the society, growth of knowledge in the society becomes totally attributable to some divine force. It is not noticed that knowledge, knowledge is a construct by society also. Knowledge is also constructed by the society. In other words, there develops a basic contradiction in these places through time between faith and knowledge. There is a part of the human being which is all the time asking questions. The, that part is not satisfied by simply being told this mother gave it to me, because that part will still ask the question, okay, how did she do it? Did she make the clouds? Where did she bring the clouds from? And you become tiresome in the way you keep asking questions. Right? So, there are two facets to human societies. One is the facet which creates knowledge, all the time which is creating knowledge. And that knowledge is born out of experience. It is empirical. You experience something, you generalize from a number of experiences and then you say, oh, so this is why the clouds came from Arabian Sea. Yes. See, that is empirical knowledge that is created out of experience. And the other is faith. Okay came from Arabian Sea, but who brought the clouds from Arabian Sea is the mother, it is her grace. So, there is a conflict between faith and knowledge and early on in agricultural societies, this conflict came into existence. And this faith versus knowledge conflict is central as we, as we shall see in the history of Europe. There was a period from around 12th century to 13th century, when institutions and organizations that controlled faith in Europe, the church, were so intolerant of any attempts at construction of knowledge that the smallest suggestion of a person articulating an in explanation for a natural phenomenon, anything other than the faith of Lord and the grace of Jesus was immediately burnt at stake. In this period say between the 12th century and the 18th century, uh, 12th century and the 14th century, several thousand people were burnt at stake in Europe for witchcraft, because if they said anything that did not include the church, that did not include the faith of the church, it was called witchcraft and they were burnt. Some of the early Protestants who broke away from the Catholic church, they were burnt as witches. Much later other Protestants gained much more popularity and the, and the Catholic church could not burn them. The rise of modern science, the rise of rational thinking surrounding modern science is a product of this conflict. It is a product of this conflict during a period which came to be known in Europe that is the 17th, that is the 18th century, late 17th century, the age of enlightenment. It was basically a product of this conflict. The age of enlightenment was the overthrow of faith and the assertion of rationality in European civilization. But you can see that all that goes back to this basic business of dealing with uncertainty. You can deal with uncertainty either through knowledge or through faith. For thousands of years, humanity had created faiths which help people cope with uncertainty, help people deal with uncertainty, created institutions of moral norms with which the religion was upheld. But this was innately contradictory to the other method in human society, which is creation of knowledge through experience. So, this conflict did come in Europe and it did lead to a large quantity of persecution of people and finally, 
it led to the age of enlightenment, which meant the liberation of a large mass of people from this kind of oppressive belief systems. So, this is something which, shall, which we shall look at, because the rise of modern economics, the rise of modern ideas like anything to do with science goes back to the age of enlightenment. So, we shall look at this period with some interest in the times to come, so that we will trace the ideas which became important during the age of enlightenment. We shall look at the thinkers who became eminent thinkers at this time, who asked questions, who raised questions. We shall look at their thoughts, their philosophies, all these things which we shall look at as a part and parcel of understanding the milieu in which modern economic ideas were born. Do you have any questions up to this point? No? All right. What we have done, I will sum up what we have done in the two sessions today. What we have done is to first understand that there is no a single monolith called economic idea. There are in fact many ideas dealing with the central issue of scarcity with which economics is dealing. And we find that through time these ideas have occurred in different epochs of human history, different times, different contexts, in different lifestyles and in different belief systems that occurred in different lifestyles, different ways of looking at life, so quite varied. So, we took a little excursion today to look at the variety of these lifestyles that happened and how the variety of ideas and belief systems occurred through this. We found that two central aspects of different lifestyles were one scarcity which all lifestyles faced and more importantly uncertainty. Uncertainty was a part of all lifestyles whether it began with hunting gathering or went through pastoral or agrarian and right through to modern times. And since uncertainty is basically something which cannot be predicted, but which has known to have a stochastic occurrence in human lifestyles that is every 30 years, every 20 years, every 5 years you know, kind of a distribution through time. You have a crisis in that area when everybody's life is affected, uncertainty hits you, a drought, a flood, a, a, a pestilence, a disease, a famine. So, catastrophes, uncert catastrophes leading to uncertainty are part of a region's cultural memory. These things are etched in the minds of the people as continuous potential threats to existence. So, how do people cope with this uncertainty? You cannot live with uncertainty forever. The best way is to create an insurance. Uncertainty is dealt with when you do an insurance and the insurance here is in beliefs. You convert the whole uncertainty into a firm belief in the immutable, irrevocable power of a divinity to which you can attribute everything. When you can thus attribute everything to this divine power, you convert all uncertainty into certainty then anything that happens which is bad, you can say this force is angry with us, appease this force. When something beautiful happens, you say this force is pleased with us. So, let us celebrate our gratitude. In other words, a whole universe called the universe of religion is created around this faith in that central force, which is the heart of religion and which in my opinion serves the social function tremendously of an insurance against uncertainty. <coughs> Religions create a whole set of moral norms for their own sustenance, for their own survival and these moral, norm, moral norms become the guidelines for all human conduct in that society. Every facet of human life is regulated and conducted and monitored through moral norms. 
in a traditional society for instance, how closely life was monitored was when a person started learning, at what time, what age was decided, when a per person grew up was declared to be an adult that was also decided, when a person got married that was also decided and equally important the moral norms decide how many times and in what frequency and at what times of the month these two people will cohabit with each other and beget children. So, even that was dictated and thoroughly governed by moral norms. So, that the whole of family life from the birth of a child to the death of a man because the last rites performed to a, death for to a man who has died are supposed to influence all those who survive. So, moral the world the moral universe controlled all of human existence, the whole of agriculture, the whole of economic activities, which is why modern science, modern scholars like James Scott when they went and lived in traditional societies they called them what times of the month these two people will cohabit with each other and beget children. So, even that was dictated and thoroughly governed by moral norms. So, that the whole of family life from the birth of a child to the death of a man because the last rites performed to a, death for to a man who has died are supposed to influence all those who survive. So, moral the world the moral universe controlled all of human existence, the whole of agriculture, the whole of economic activities which is why modern science, modern scholars like James Scott when they went and lived in traditional societies they called them the moral economy. However, there existed and there came into existence a basic conflict within the society between two facets of human society. One is the facet of human society which deals with curiosity, which tries to explain and understand human experience in an logical explainable manner, in an empirical manner too. This is the construction of knowledge in societies. All societies are great constructors of knowledge. After all, let us face it, we did not simply create all the gods and divinities, we did not simply create 48,000 gods in this country, we created the numerals, we created astronomy, we created a lot of things which are construction of knowledge too. So, there is this part of the society which seeks to construct knowledge, there is this other part of the society which seeks to perpetuate a faith as a social insurance against uncertainty, there is a potential conflict always ready round the corner between these two aspects of society. Because faiths deny experience, it is the nature of a faith to deny human experience and it is the nature of experience and understanding of experience to look for explanations not for faith. So, there is a potential conflict in this and in all over the world this conflict surfaced at some point or other in the history of western Europe. In the history of Europe this conflict surfaced started surfacing from around the 11th and 12th century when a lot of attempt at explaining the world was declared to be witchcraft and thousands of people got burnt at stake. But subsequently by the time you were round the corner of the 15th century onwards, you found repeatedly the world of religion gets challenged first from within itself. There were religious leaders who were, who were coming up in Europe who said this church is not the way to explain our lives. The church is not necessary as a mediator between me and God. I can relate directly to God, I protest against this church. So, they came to be called protestants and then came a whole new world of thinking of looking at the world of explaining science, logic, rationality. So, that the later half of 17th century and the whole of 18th century came to be, came to be called the age of enlightenment. It was enlightenment because it was the age when faiths lost ground gave way to the power of explanation, the power of reason and in this age of enlightenment was born most of modern science, modern technology, almost all of modern political institutions and eventually also modern economics. What we shall do in the classes to come 
is to look at this process from the age of enlightenment onwards and go and look at the study of evolution of modern economics. Do you have any questions on this? We are almost done, we are almost done for today. Um, I have given you some books to copy or Xerox and once you have Xerox them, I have also marked out the chapters from which you will have to read it and then I will also tell you as to how to use these, this material to gather the kind of knowledge you have and uh, by next week we should know how to organize our process of learning this quite thoroughly and quite comfortably. Well, good evening.